We could find a memory box in each household, hidden in a crumpled shoe box under the bed or in a cubby hole. They keep old notes, useless holiday mementos with chopped corners, four diaries, all with a first date but never finished, one forgotten earring and, of course, the blanket of dust covering everything. What are these things? What stories do they tell? Are they all truly worthy of being kept? Or perhaps they're just taking up space in our already overcrowded lives? We could say that these boxes drowning in memories are a type of personal museum archive that tells us about the individual or even the times. A museum is quite capable of unraveling a certain phenomenon. However, it firstly consists of things, artifacts that tell interesting stories about our relationships with them. Yes. Indeed, a museum is only one form of expression of this very particular relationship between people and things, whereby a person takes and selects certain items from their environment with an intention to pass them on to future generations. This is the museum relation, or a musilia relationship, in academic terms. For example, archaeologists and other researchers propose that this type of relationship came about as early as the second millennium before Christ, when this type of progression in the antiquity can be observed. They would collect clay plates, this and other various sticks. And we too have our collections, where we keep certain cultural valuables. Perhaps it's a pebble found by the sea, or a feather from an exotic country, a memento, or anything else. Since ancient times, people brimming with curiosity and the joy of exploration have collected and displayed curiosities. It is true that at the beginning, these collections had a slightly different role. We should clarify one thing. A public museum is a rather recent institution that's around 200 years old. However, collecting and gathering only begins with noble families. Well, aristocracy too, whereby some things are passed on from generation to generation and all those portraits of grandparents and great-grandparents in the palace, or some rooms with collections significant to the family, or art rooms, they first begin to form in private spaces. Perhaps the most curious phenomena of modern times is this very thing, where we move from a private artistic space, a Kunstkammer, a room keeping pieces of art, to a public space that can be visited and enjoyed by everyone. Cabinets of curiosities or wonder rooms appearing in the middle of the 16th century may be considered the precursors to museums. They started popping up in the homes of kings and aristocrats like mushrooms after a refreshing Renaissance reign. These cabinets usually collected and displayed antique artifacts, natural history objects, e.g. taxidermy items, dried insects, skeletons, shells, and fossils, as well as pieces of art. One of the key characteristics of the cabinet is that they had to evoke wonder. Collecting was both a piece in an intellectual and a social game. Demonstrating a collection of curiosities was a great indicator of one's wealth, intellect, and social status. It is debatable which museum holds the title of the first public museum. However, this very relationship, the collecting itself that births museums, is very old. And then the museum itself. Why such an odd name? We're schooled in a school. We're hospitalized in hospitals. So what do we do in museums? This word originates from muses, the temple of muses, the museum. Just like music, these nine deities were the guardians of arts. So what is the connection between the muses and the museum? There were also different names to call a collection or a place displaying it. For example, a gallery, a wonder room, or a cabinet. In the Middle Ages, they were called thesauruses and treasuries. The only thing is that up until the middle of the 18th century, Anything that bore relation to a museum was an exclusive spectacle accessible by a small group of people of a certain class only, or perhaps a personal space which one enjoyed and admired, where one took inspiration, etc. A museum could be not only a collection, but also a type of activity that one would partake in with that collection. It would be one of those important phenomena then, during the French Revolution, when the rebels vandalized and pillaged the homes of the aristocracy, somebody realized that it was art and great art valuables that were being destroyed. They asked that these homes would be closed and then reopened with a different purpose, not a private living space, because it indeed was somebody's natural living space, 
but brought to the open by inviting those people that couldn't experience such a living environment. To come and look at the way the aristocracy lived, at the art valuables they had collected. And that was the first way to do this, perhaps through preservation, as a response to the fear that it would all disappear. A museum is a temple of memories for the modern man, sitting upon four pillars with four purposes – saving, collecting, researching, and displaying. Usually we only see and clearly understand the last one. However, the first three also hold great importance. With the internet, the encyclopedias and the libraries have been decaying, not with their constant use, but rather age. All information has been easily loaded onto the cloud, with us barely lifting a finger. There, we're done. But what do we do with these things? In the age of the internet, does the museum function as a large storage room only? How should the museums change, adapt, or perhaps they should maintain their valuable existence? The digital space allows us to create many virtual museums that do not necessarily need any material things. They don't have to worry about their preservation, restoration, the costs of safekeeping and storage. When you think about it, there are so many things, museums, archives in the Western world, that keep and accumulate, but you never know you might need it someday. And yes, it is such a slow institution. And here you suddenly have a digital virtual museum, art without boundaries, with 25,000 images for you to look at from the comfort of your home, without any effort. This instantly changes the worth of those museums that are restoring this one piece for many years and then exhibiting it. But how do you compete with the digital? There's a very interesting phenomena of fatigue from digital media in museums. It used to be considered a super project, and everyone aimed to have as many screens as possible, as many touch screens, as many things of that sort. I've noticed that museums are trying to stop that somehow because design and technology get old quickly and very noticeably. They get old insanely fast. You come in and see immediately that the exhibits or stories or the designs are already three years old. Whereas in 2018, on a clear evening, right after closing, the 200-year-old National Museum of Brazil in Rio de Janeiro was engulfed in flames. More than 90% of the 20 million historical objects stored in the archives burned to a crisp. To everyone's greatest disappointment, the fire couldn't be put out due to the dehydrated fire hydrants. The arrows of blame penetrated the problematic and culturally adverse politics of Brazil. According to the anthropologist Eduardo Viveros de Castro, this fire forever swallowed the material memory of the nations that were torn apart by colonialism, the materiality that quietly lay in the museum as a witness to the sinister history of European invasions in the Americas. A loss of this extent shows the value of museum artifacts, their fragility, and most importantly, their irreplaceability. No matter how many funds we would collect to reconstruct this or a similar museum, the historical testaments could never be restored. In a sense, I can see this trend as a response to total digitization, virtual museums. Physical museums are returning to the things, to the masterwork. It is better to show less. For example, an exhibition of this one thing that has an incredible story, that changes narratives, or something like that. That's one of the trends. And again, the old museums, in a way, win in the competition against the plethora of new virtual museums exhibiting daily life. This is the real thing. I'd say that's the trend. I guess the fact that museums collect and what they collect is an important element. This type of accumulation seemed quite interesting to me, looking at it from the perspective of the Dutch or the British. In the Netherlands, one of the museologists says, is it really meaningful to accumulate everything or to continue preserving the things already accumulated? And why? Do we actually, as a society, interpret these things in some way, use them? Is it important to us at all? A few examples. The Dutch paintings from the 17th century. There are tons of those paintings from their golden age. Around 90% of them are stored, but there is only so few that are actually exhibited. Everything else is just kept in storage. It may sound like a revolutionary idea, 
But why not give these paintings to people to add to their interiors, so they could live, so they could exist, taking into account all the risk that they may be damaged or perhaps not saved. But then, what is more important? Artifacts, witnesses of real events and periods, can color a vast and richly painted layer of cultural history. In an archaeology exhibition, authentic Baltic artifact gives us an opportunity to take a guess about the craftsmanship of Balts and about their anthropomorphic rituals. Whereas the woman's snuff box, elaborately carved out of ivory and hidden under the glass in a mansion, can tell about the habits and wealth of the period society, as well as the resources exploited in the colonized regions. For example, the Egyptian mummies that are abundant in the British Museum, or the goodies stolen from the indigenous people and laid out for the delighted looks in an exhibit. We wouldn't be wrong to refer to these things in a less euphemistic way, as loot, war loot. On the other hand, these exhibits are collected valuables, pieces of art, documents, etc. They are maintained, they educate people. On the other hand, these exhibits were stolen from somebody and then appropriated. Should the museums return their hmm, stolen objects? Or should they, in the spirit of the colonial history, continue to greedily hold on to them because they represent a massive symbolic capital? I find it very interesting the way they justify collecting the artifacts from the antiquity and transporting them to the museums of the biggest European cities. They justify it by saying that those countries cannot take care of the entire fountainhead of European culture. As a result, these artifacts must find shelter somewhere else. And the countries that have the experts and the scientists, who have extensive experience and who will give them a better life, hold the rights to them. There is still a debate as to the Elgin marbles, belonging to the Lord of Elgin. He acquired these Parthian moldings in Greece and took them to the British Museum. The dispute for them to be returned to Greece is still ongoing. The British are not giving them back because the Greeks, at that time, could not take care of the cultural fountainhead. Accordingly, Brits had to, let's say, take matters into their own hands. The British Museum is the largest museum of world history. It still holds around 8 million objects in its blood-stained hands. In addition to being an exceptional educational institution, the British Museum is also the recipient of a large corpus of criticism. What would this honorable depository of artifacts look like without all its colonial loot? It is estimated that no less than 90% of African cultural valuables are involuntarily stored in Europe. The Western world rarely encounters an attitude that's not Eurocentric. But let's imagine the way a resident of modern-day Nigeria would feel in an exhibition that displays the treasures of their killed and looted ancestors, their pieces of art and cult objects. In 1897, British soldiers invading the Kingdom of Benin stole around 4,000 sculptures that are better known as the Benin Bronzes. After more than 100 years, these bronze valuables are dispersed around the world and are displayed not only in the British museums, but also German, Austrian, and American museums and private collections. We could find them anywhere, except in their place of origin, Nigeria. Nigeria's applications to have their heritage returned have not been successful. After long disputes, the light-fingered concertmaster decided that the sculptures shall be lent. I think that what has happened to museums in the past few years shows that they cannot hold on to the status quo, to continue as if nothing has changed. They cannot continue storing and exhibiting artifacts that were stolen in the colonialism era, as well as works that are obviously underpinned by sexist and racist motifs, which have been on display for hundreds of years. Museums are wondering now what to do with the hundreds of paintings that show naked girls with black help staff. They must reconsider their assets, rethink the Western consciousness, and present it to their audience in a critically aware way. One of the approaches is not to show these works at all, or to show them by pointing a finger to the wrongs depicted in this art, to exhibit while talking about the mistakes that were, and still are, and have been, firmly rooted in our society. So whose property are these pieces of history? Unfortunately, there is no easy answer yet. Many museums have been asking themselves this question, looking the embarrassing colonial history in the eye, with a bit of more determination each time. 
the policy of the French President Emmanuel Macron has had a positive mark so far, and its most significant effect has been the initiation of a law that promises to return objects where the original owner requests them. The identification and return of the stolen museum artifacts to the countries of their origin is called repatriation, a term also applied to the returning of the prisoners of war. You can do the maths on that. A thing placed under the glass and lit up in a large room on a white cube instantly becomes special. In the spotlight, it takes on the role of a mediator of a story that is part of a broader history. What to do when there are thousands of such things? That's where we necessarily encounter the significance of a curator's creative role. Then again, the biggest museums, according to the statistics, display about 2% of their funds and collections. So many things never see the light of day. We must not forget that the largest museums were also established as research institutions, inviting those that are interested, as well as experts whose whole profession is to research them. Yes, I think that a curator must be very sensitive, just like an artist, to the changes in the environment. They can constantly rearrange the things or pieces of art that they see every day by highlighting the way they reflect the themes of today. Or by saying, look, in the 50s, this artist predicted today's situation. The curator takes one thing out, lights it up in a new way, and adapts it, actualizes it, or emphasizes the relevant issues, and then exhibits it. The museum is an honored juicer, which both selects the best fruit of content and comes up with recipes that refresh the screen-drained brain. Creating an exhibit is an art that requires a lot of sensibility. When we talk to museums, it's important to us that they should be self-critical and self-reflective. What's new is that museums, conservative organizations, compared to the contemporary art centers, are changing their strategy and are inviting contemporary art curators. Museums often invite artists to take a walk amongst their collections and curate their own exhibitions. It is often awkward for the museums, perhaps embarrassing, but if they are inviting this artist, they are ready or not ready for such a risk. Artists are a type of a parasite that burrows into an organism and digs up everything that is bad within it. There is a conflict that presents in museums as to who decides what to display. As we know, the choices often reflect their worldview and shape a certain ideology. That is why collections don't feature many women, currently. There is an attempt at battle and an effort to change this. Regarding the discussions in curator practices at the moment, because a curator is the one that chooses what to display, there are trends, again, coming from the Netherlands and from the Anglo-Saxon countries, saying that curators cannot create on their own anymore. They may be a person that is an expert in one area, but they aren't able to cover all the other elements. Museums are rather conservative and, in my opinion, and in many cases, they don't take on changes too easily. The fact that a museum could play a social role by gathering people, by offering a space for discussion, is on its way, but not yet established. It hasn't become a norm that a museum could be this socially active character. There's the question of relevance. It's sort of in time. But a museum is not part of news media that operates in the moment. It requires a certain distance and time to collect these viewpoints. These are long processes. How do we, as a society, think? How do we reflect so this reflection is meaningful, not just imagined? Toilet museum, banana museum, craft macaroni museum, and perhaps even a museum of bad art. Even though it all sounds a little silly, these museums are real. Collecting, accumulating valuable artifacts and displaying them seem to be the qualities of the human condition. Even though the perception and function of museums can change with times, we could never doubt the importance of this institution. How does a Hopes and Wishes Museum sound? Museum of Unsent Love Letters or Museum of Dust Seen Through the Microscope? We haven't found these yet, but we have already understood that we can build a museum ourselves. As soon as we have an ethically accumulated collection that answers questions relevant to a slightly larger audience.